Okay, so we're continuing with the one-way ANOVA activity today here, and we're starting on the section where we're checking model assumptions. Uh, so we talked about how we see this outward fanning pattern in the residuals, indicating that the homoscedasticity assumption is violated. Here we're going to assume an independent sample since these are measurements for different participants, different people. Okay, and then for checking the normality assumption, so we use only the top left plot to check the homoscedasticity assumption. For normality, we check the quantile quantile plot, which SAS gives as residual by quantile, and the histogram of the residuals. So these two plots for the normality assumption. So the only ones we need for one-way ANOVA assumptions for checking those are all the ones in the very leftmost column. The other ones are extra and they're more useful for regression models, but we're not gonna look at them for ANOVA. Um, so for the QQ plot and the histogram, again, I give this section in the guide for STAT 216 document uh, for showing cases where this is met and where it's violated. I think, again, because it's easy to be too picky and expect like a perfect bell shape or a perfect pattern in the QQ plot. Um, but we don't need it to be perfect. It's just, it needs to be good enough. Um, so here's some examples. Again, this leftmost plot is data that is truly normal. And here's how the histogram looks when that's the case. Okay, so notice again, not perfect. It actually almost makes you a little nervous because it's because it looks like there's two peaks, but this is how real data looks because of randomness. Um, problematic distributions are over here. So this one's bimodal and then it has two peaks. This one's much more peaked, has a really tall center. Um, and this is actually generated from what's called a Cauchy distribution, which is kind of similar to the normal distribution, but very peaked. Um, so these two cases would violate the normality assumption if we saw that in the histogram of the residuals. And here's the corresponding QQ plots for that same data. Okay. So again, if the normality assumption is met, the points will all stay close to or right on this diagonal line. Okay. So this first plot is where the, normal, the normality assumption is met uh, because the points don't stray far from that diagonal line. Whereas here, you can see uh, a lot of the points fall off the line, showing that normality is violated. Okay. And I think the Cauchy distribution, like without this density curve, it may be a little bit hard to tell that this is not normal but the QQ plot really gives it away. This is very problematic seeing this pattern here. Okay. And so if, if there's ever disagreements between the two plots, because you kind of check both, I would say rely on the one that's more problematic. Like overall, I would say based on this, the normality assumption is not met for this third case, letter C. If you're ever checking assumptions for a homework, it's sufficient if you just check one of them and do it correctly. Um, but for like real life, I would check both um, just to cover your bases, I guess. Uh, and yeah, and here's other cases where it's violated. So here plots A and B, it's violated, right skewed and left skewed data. But plot C, this is if, for some reason, your response values were all whole numbers, but the normality assumption can still be met there. Uh, it looks a little bit choppy, but when you look at the QQ plot, okay, it's actually, that's fine. That's acceptable there. Uh, the plot, the points don't stray too far from the line. Um, and what's interesting too here is you can see when the data is right skewed, you get this upward bend in the points on the QQ plot that always happens. And when the plot is left skewed, you get this 
downward bend. Okay. So QQ plot can kind of tell you about skewness a little bit as well in that way. Okay. okay. So taking all that in, based on the QQ plot and the histogram here, how are you feeling about the normality assumption? Doesn't look bad. No, it doesn't look like it's in my thing. Oh, right. Yeah, and what, what's concerning about it? Um, <clears throat> the histogram is peaked. Yeah, the histogram is very peaked. Uh, that's a problem for sure. And then what do we see in the QQ plots? Kind of strays away in the middle. Yeah, strays away in the middle and the tails. Yeah, usually, yeah. usually the most problems are in the tails for real data like that. So this one kind of has that upward bend a little bit. So, right. Yeah, I would. the normality assumption is very problematic here, actually. Okay. So... The histogram is very peaked. And it, it's a little bit hard to tell, but it is right skewed. I don't think this plot does a good job of showing it. That's why the, the QQ plot more shows that upward bend, and the which indicates right skewness. So histogram is very peaked and right skewed. The Q, Q, QQ plot has many points straying far from the diagonal line. So overall, the normality assumption is violated. And again, to emphasize, we have uh, 64 observations. So normally it might be tempting to say like, oh, but the central limit theorem takes care of it. We can't use the central limit theorem though uh, for one-way ANOVA. So if normality is problematic, you can't use the one-way ANOVA for that data directly. Okay. There's other things you can do. Um, a common option is to use uh, what's called a non-parametric test, which is essentially like a similar version of this test that does not require normality. Um, so there's a version of that for the two-sample t-test is called the Wilcoxon rank sum test. It is very similar to the two-sample t-test but does not require normality. There's one for the one-way ANOVA uh, called the Kriskal Wallace test. So it, it tests if the median response value is equal across the groups. I used to teach that in this class. Like when I took this class, we had to learn about all those, um, but it's optional now. So we're not going to cover those in depth, uh, but just know that those are available. Another common option that people do, which is what's most commonly people do in this case, is to use um, a transformation of the data, which we'll talk about in just a little bit. But first, we'll we'll keep pretending like we're going on with this test, uh, even though the assumptions are violated. So, uh, any questions on the assumptions before we move on to the ANOVA table? Okay. So the ANOVA table is something we get, again, when fitting an ANOVA model in SAS. Uh, so this is also in the guide for STAT 216 document. Okay. Right here. Uh, so I gave the very general versions or like the general terms you get in the model in the ANOVA table, but these are all actual numbers in SAS when it gives it to us. So here's the numbers. Uh, so an important thing to be able to do given the ANOVA table is to interpret the SS values in context. Okay. So 
we can literally copy this from the guide for STAT 216 document, and then we'll update it for the given problem. Okay. So this is under the one-way ANOVA section. Oops, is that the, wait. Um, oh, I was in two-way ANOVA actually. Okay, but I have this for one-way ANOVA, so let's go up. Okay, there we go. Not to two-way ANOVA yet. Okay. All right, so SS groups. Okay, so these are the general blueprint interpretations of these values, but we'll update it for this given context. So SS groups, sometimes it's called SS model, sometimes it's called SS groups. Uh, you know, it, it would be nice if they used just one name for things in statistics, but they don't. <laughs> uh, I'm trying to think of what other names people call that, depending on SS model and SS groups. Anyway, that's referring to this row. Um, so SS groups, SS stands for sum of squares, is this value right here. So 11... Five three five seven. Okay, so we want to give the value of it like that, and then we'll say which is the amount of variability in, and then we're going to update this for the context of this problem. So the response variable in this case. What's our response variable this time? Yes, survival time and days, right? Um, thanks. In the survival times and days, uh, explained by the, and then what was our explanatory variable? Right, yeah, by the yeah type of cancer. Mm -hmm. So that's what I'm looking for there for interpreting these SS values. Okay. This is listed as one of the things that you're supposed to learn from this class. It's how to interpret these SS values. So you can imagine this will be an important thing on say a homework or exam, being able to do this. So SSE, sum of squares, error, we've got, that is this number right here. So two, six, four. Yeah, so many digits here. Um, And then the same thing, yeah, survival time and days. Not explained by And it's very common for people to uh, like, yeah, why this is important besides just it's listed in the class requirements. Um, when people run a one-way ANOVA model and they do a research study and type up their results, they'll pretty much always give the ANOVA table and give like the SS values. So this is how you can interpret or see what those mean. Okay. And then SS total is the total amount of variability in the survival times. And that value, 
and remember the relationship between different numbers in the table. If we take SS model or SS groups <clears throat> plus SSE. That gives us SS total. So you can sum down the columns. This plus this equals SS total. And you can do the same thing with the degrees of freedom. 4 plus 59 is 63. Okay. Um, so again, yeah, maybe something that would come up on an exam or something where parts of the table are missing. And then you have to fill in the numbers using the equations that we know. Um, so yeah, that's you can sum down the DF column, the degrees of freedom column. You can sum down the SS yes. column. Uh, the F statistic, again, is equal to, um, so like in this case, you have F in general is equal to MS model divided by MSE. Okay. As you can see in the in the I give that up here. Yeah, F is equal to MS groups over MSE or MS model over MSE. Okay. So that's another thing that we can get uh, from the ANOVA table as well if parts of that are missing. And then does anyone remember if we had these two columns, how could we calculate the MS values? Does anyone remember that? Exactly, yeah. So. MSE is equal to SSE divided by degrees of freedom error. So it goes across the row where this divided by this gives you MSE. And then similarly for this one, this divided by this gives you MS groups. And I said this last time, but to yeah, to reemphasize or explain like why are people doing this? Why do we even care about this table? Um, this made it easier to do the ANOVA model by hand because it sort of broke it up into pieces. And then I think just sort of conveniently you can interpret some of those pieces along the way. But the main point of this table was to calculate the F test statistic by hand, which sort of breaks it up into first. It's like, okay. Here's how you can calculate the degrees of freedom. And then they would calculate sum of squares, which then allowed people to get the MS values. And the ratio of those gives you the F test statistic. Okay, so that's the whole purpose of the ANOVA table. And then people still just report it now, even though software just skips right to the F statistic, you can get it like that, but it's still reported. So it's good to know how to understand the parts of the ANOVA table. Okay, so assuming assumptions were met, even though they were not, we can pretend like we're interpreting the result of this overall F test for this ANOVA model. So just like the two sample t-tests, we compare the p-value to 0.05, okay? And SAS gives the p-value in this very last column here. Uh, so since, the p-value equals 0 0.0. It's less than 0 0.05. We would reject the null hypothesis at the 5% significance level if assumptions had been met. We'll say like that. Suggesting that 
So what does that tell us about the average survival for the cancer types? Difference between them and significant. Right. Yeah, there's a difference between them. Suggesting that the average survival in days differs by cancer type. Okay. Yeah. But like in reality, we we actually can't make that conclusion, right? Because those assumptions aren't met. Right. Not like in like a real scenario. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, so this p value, like SAS gives us that number, but it relies on theory that the assumptions were met. <clears throat> Since they're not, the p value is kind of meaningless. Okay. Yeah. And it doesn't mean that we know it's one way or the other. Like it could be that the p value is supposed to be smaller, actually supposed to be bigger. <clears throat> We just we just don't know. Yeah. Um, okay. But even when the assumptions are met, this is how you interpret the results of the one-way ANOVA model. It's a little bit unsatisfying, I guess, in a way, right? It's a little bit vague because we're just saying one of the cancer types has a different survival on average than another one. And that's our conclusion. That's as specific as we can get. It's not very helpful for uh, real life if we were trying to investigate this, right? Um, we're probably interested in like which cancer type survived the longest on average, uh, which was the shortest, which groups differed if, if any. So um, ANOVA doesn't really answer all of that stuff directly, okay? unlike the two sample t-test where you can compare, okay, there, there was a difference, which group was higher? And then you have a definitive answer. Uh, this one leaves it open-ended. Um, but that can be addressed using what's called a post hoc analysis, which we'll start looking at in this activity to, to investigate which groups differed exactly. But before we get to that, again, the post hoc, like doing that part would be conditional on assumptions being met. So here, nope, the model assumptions were not met. So this is not a valid result. Okay. All right. So what do you do? Okay. Uh, so real life, right? This was a data set where they tried to give a treatment to patients with cancer. We collected all this data and then the model assumptions are not met. Um, so that was, you know, probably an expensive study. People went through a lot of effort. Um, <clears throat> We don't want to just toss the data aside and say, oh, the model assumptions weren't met. We can't do anything with that. You know, um, we still want to figure out something. So what people do in real life is either use like a non-parametric test instead, like I said, so we would use the Kruskal Wallace test here. Or what's more common, we can do some type of transformation of the response variable so that assumptions are met for the model now. Yeah. Does this happen pretty often where um, you put, you like spend a bunch of money, take all this time, collect all the data, and then it's not met, or is it kind of more of a rare occurrence? Uh, I would say it's decently often, but it's not surprising in that like people know ahead of time often that you need to do a transformation. Okay. So it's like anticipated. Yeah. Like I, I worked on a study um, with, genetics data in grad school, and they were counting. Uh, so like we were doing t-tests and it was like, we had uh, Petri dishes of cells. And then there was like uh, cells from uh, people of European descent and people of African descent. And we wanted to see if like the cells had different survival when chemicals tobacco product chemicals were applied to them. 
And so it's like known that the number of cells that survived is like really right skewed, mm -hmm. likely, but you just do a log transformation and then you can still do a T test ahead of time. Um, right. So yeah, that was another example where it's like, that was a really expensive study and they still want results from it. So they, yeah, they just do a log transformation, um, which is what we're going to do here. So uh, yeah, very often you have a case where a response variable is non-negative and unbounded. So in this case, patients can keep surviving. There's no limit to that. Um, or like the scenario I talked about, like the number of cells that were alive in the Petri dish can be really big. Uh, there's no technical limit on that, I guess. So you end up with very right skewed data. Um, and it's known that if you do a square root transformation of that, of something that's positive and really right skewed, or a log transformation of that, it tends to make it more bell-shaped. Okay. And so what's the log transformation? Okay, if you're like me coming out of high school, uh, I only had a little bit of calculus, so I wasn't the most familiar with what the log transformation was. Okay. Uh, the log transformation, uh, let's see, maybe I'll open up R here to show that real quick. Which is another software, statistics software, but um, okay. So if you have like, I'll say like right skewed data. Okay. So let's say I have these 200 values. Okay. And I have a distribution that looks like this, super right skewed, okay? Like how our residuals maybe look. If you do a log transformation of those, it's still somewhat problematic here. Oh, it doesn't look great. Still doesn't look great, but it gets a little bit more bell shaped. So the log transformation can help with that skewness a bit. Now it's actually left skewed somewhat, but um, and how those values look. So like maybe you have raw values like this. Okay, so here's all your numbers. When you take the log of it. You still get a set of numbers. They're just changed slightly. Okay. Um, so you don't have to understand much about the log function other than that put one number into it, you get another number out. Um, the reason we can still use a log transformation to compare survival between patients here is because of the sounds really fancy, I guess, monotonicity property of the log function. So what that means is that if, um, let's say we have one survival time, S1, if S1 is bigger than S2, so if one patient survived longer than another patient, then the log of their survival time will always be bigger than the log of the other patient's survival time. Okay. So the ordering of the values is maintained or retained after the transformation of the data. That's what makes it what we call a monotone function in math. Okay. If you have a monotone function, you can do that transformation and then still do a test like this because the idea is if if the log survival time was diff was higher for one group than the other 
that tells us that the original survival time is higher for one group than the other. Because that ordering is preserved, that's why people can do the transformation and it's still valid. Any questions about that? And this is true as well for other transformations. So sometimes people do like the square root. That works as well. And that also tends to um, fix the skewness a little bit in a way. So um, yeah, pulling up R again to show what that. Ooh. show what that looks like. Um, okay, so like another common right skewed distribution is a uh, chi-squared distribution. So like, so here I'm like making up fake data from a chi-squared. So again, this gives a histogram that's quite, quite right skewed. Uh, okay, so right skewed. But if we did a square root transformation, that also tends to make it look a little bit better. Yeah, the square root transformation worked a lot better that time. Yeah, so, so now much more bell-shaped, so that's why people do this transformation, because then you can do this one-way ANOVA test still, okay, and not just have to throw away the data after you went through all that work and the patients went through the whole clinical trial. You want to, like, still use the data for something, so... Um, <clears throat> Okay, so yeah, the log transformation is the most common. If you have zeros in your data set, that causes problems because the log, um, try and do everything in the Zoom meeting. The log of zero, does anybody know what that is equal to? Anything back to calculus? Uh, log of Log of one is zero, um, right? It's undefined. It's actually negative infinity, right? So undefined, yeah, same thing. Um, so that's problematic. If you have a zero in your data set and you take the log of it, having infinity in all the numbers, will the, the model won't work anymore. Um, but that's why sometimes people would use the square root transformation instead, because then the square root of zero is defined. That's just zero. So that's one way people handle that. I also saw this in grad school, although I don't know how much I think this is a good idea. Um, one of my professors was like, oh, when that's the case, instead of just doing like log of X, just do log of X plus one. So that if you have any zeros, then everything's still defined. But I feel like you start to get further and further away from the original data as you do a weirder transformation. So this still has like the monotone property where the ordering of values is retained, but I would do the square root rather than something like that. But, um, okay, so that's talking about the transformations, which is done quite often. And that's why we're bringing it up. So here's the, let's look back. Here's, okay, here's the box plots of the original data, the raw survival times. After doing a log transformation in SAS, and we, we saw they were right skewed with outliers. After doing a log transformation in SAS, here's how the survival times look now. Okay. 
So the ordering is still preserved, but they're much more symmetric distributions now. If you look at the mean relative to the median, like this one's a tiny bit right skewed, this one's a tiny bit left skewed, left skewed, right skewed, left skewed actually. Okay. All right. Um, yeah, so that's the log survival time. Okay, we can get, we have it log survival now. We have the average log survival for each of the cancer types and then the standard deviations for that. Okay, and we have our new diagnostic plots now. Um, so this might seem like really great and wonderful that we did this transformation and now the assumptions are met. You might even wonder, why don't we do that every time, some type of transformation to make the assumptions even better? Um, well, this came at a cost a little bit. So now everything that we're doing is in terms of the log survival. So anytime we give interpretations, like confidence intervals, interpreting the hypothesis test. To be correct, we have to be saying the log survival. And so you kind of lost some interpretability uh, between the groups when doing that. Uh, so still meaningful, but that, that's the cost, the interpret interpretability. Okay. Okay, so... Yeah, let's see. Okay, check whether the assumptions are met. Almost elasticity and then normality. Okay. So homoscedasticity, let's see. Again, we only check the top left plot. How does that look now? Yeah, it's not not great, but it's certainly better, right? Um, like if you, yeah, if you think of like this this vertical distance here compared to here, it's actually pretty similar, right? It's not too bad. Certainly better if we go back this vertical distance compared to this one, this is like twice as big, at least. Okay, now it's much better. Um, so the vertical distance going from the left to right of the residual by predicted value plot is fairly constant. Okay. And then that wasn't the only way we can check homoscedasticity. Does anyone remember the other way? Using the standard deviations. Um, yeah, we're going to look at the standard deviations to do this. So the other rule of thumb, go back up which we didn't do for the first time, but this is the other way. I recommend the plots, but if you do either of these ways, that's sufficient. So you take the biggest standard deviation for any group divided by the smallest. And if that ratio is less than two, that suggests homoscedasticity is met. Okay. So, Actually, looking at that, did, did we have the standard deviations for the first one? Uh, oh, okay, we did. So we, we could have checked that there as well. Let's let's maybe go back and do that real quick. So S max over S min. So looking back, yeah, uh, at the untransformed data, we had this table. 
what would be S max and S min? Yep, yeah, that's the max. And then the min is 209. Yep. So if we look at the ratio of those, 1238. And again, the res checking the residual by fitted value plot is sufficient, but if you wanted to do it like this. I'm not going to know what I'm meaning. Uh, oh, no, it did. Okay. This is like the, in math, it's like approximately. So squiggles. Okay. So, so yeah, sorry. Switching gears back to the before the log transformation, this ratio was about six. So much bigger than two. Indicating that homeless kid elasticity is violated. So we can check it for the log of transformed values now too. Okay. So for the log transformed values, here's our values right here. Okay, so now our ratio is 1.6. That's what it is. If you use like four decimals for each of them, it's usually plenty good enough, but. which is about 1.73, which is smaller than two, indicating that homoscedasticity is met. So that's the other way, if you were a little, yeah, maybe understandably like, is it met though still? That's where you could use the other criteria and be like, okay, that's reassuring. Any questions about how we checked that? So yeah, we got it from this table here. 
Um, again, I don't recommend, which is why I don't even list it in like the guide for STAT 216 document approach. SAS will also give you this test called Levine's test for homogeneity of variance. Essentially, Levine's test for homoscedasticity. Okay. This is a, itself an F test testing that this assumption of homoscedasticity is met. Um, just like those normality tests that we saw before for the two sample T test. This has similar issues as those, which is why I don't recommend using it. But if it's also reassuring, the p value here is big, which indicates that homoscedasticity is met as well. So when this is bigger than 0.05, that suggests equal variances is met. And I think if we saw, so this was for the log transformation. I don't know if I gave it for the regular data. Oh, I did. Okay. So for the regular data, the p-value was really small. So it suggested that um, almost desticity was violated. Okay. All right. Just in case you encounter Levine's test in the wild, but okay. So for normality, how are we feeling about normality now? Looks pretty good. Yeah, it looks really good. So yeah, homoscedasticity was still a little bit, but normality looks great. Like if we think back to again, you don't need it perfect. So like here's a QQ plot where it truly is normal. We look at that, look at this. It's pretty similar get a lot of points right on the line. Okay, so since the points stay close to the diagonal line on the QQ plot, And then the histogram as well. You could say this is a little bit left skewed, but it's unimodal, one peak, fairly bell shaped. Yeah, it's, it's good enough. So, so the histogram. All right. <clears throat> okay. So let's practice interpreting the result of this one way ANOVA model. Um, even though I don't ask for it, I don't think. No. Okay, but we'll still do that here. So, you know, something I might ask you to do is give the test statistic. We're not going to interpret the sum of squares values again, but uh, say maybe you want to give the test statistic, p value, decision, and conclusion in context. Okay. We could give all these things 
Okay, so the test statistic. So what's our test statistic value here from the ANOVA table? Yeah, the 4.29. Thanks. So it's an F test statistic for ANOVA. Um, the P value, SAS likes to give P values as capital PR greater than something. It'll say F for the F test, says T for the T test. The PR stands for probability. Uh, so P value is 0 0.0041. And note that for the, the two sample t-tests in like SAS, sometimes you want to do like a one-tailed test or a two-tailed test. So you need to like worry about, do you divide the p-value by two or not? For the one-way ANOVA, there's only this version of the test. There's no one-tailed version of the test, anything like that. So the p-value is, is what it is. Um, so our decision, since the p-value is less than 0.05, what's our decision about the null hypothesis? Do we reject or fail to reject? Yes. Reject, right? Um, we reject the null hypothesis. Okay, so conclusion in context. Um, Okay, so I give blueprint interpretations again in the guide for STAT 216 document. So which of these two are we taking, the top or the bottom one? The top one. This, so rejecting the null is a what they call a statistically significant result. Okay, so we can start with that. We have sufficient evidence that put alternative hypothesis in words here. If we were writing out our hypotheses, Sure, let's, I guess we didn't do that either. Let's maybe do that real quick. Okay. So we can copy that from step one of the one way and notice section in the guide document too. Okay. Okay, so our hypotheses are given by this, where mu i is the average. And then what would it be for this? scenario now, the log survival time, right? So that's that's where the cost came in. Uh, we have to say log survival time in days for, and then instead of group J, we'll say the, the J cancer type. Uh, oh, how many groups did we have? Five. Okay, so we had five different cancer types. So I equals five is the number of any set of groups we can be more specific to cancer types. Okay. Oops. Okay, so that's how we could give. That's a formal statement of the hypotheses, okay. which went through writing it out because that's helpful for putting our alternative hypothesis in words down here. So if we put our alternative hypothesis in words, it's that mu i does not equal mu k for some i k. Okay. 
And what does that mean? So that's saying that at least two cancer types differ in their average log survival time in days. So important to in include the units of measurement because again, it matters if we were talking about months or days or years. Okay. So that's how we can get the conclusion in context here. Any questions about how we piped out that interpretation? Okay. So again, it's a little bit ambiguous about the results. Like we're just saying two cancer types at least differ in their average log survival time. We didn't say how many groups differed. We didn't say which ones differed. ANOVA doesn't tell us that unless we do a post hoc analysis, um, which post hoc is comes from like Latin for after this analysis. So it's like after a statistically significant result analysis. Um, so you only do a post hoc if you have a statistically significant result. Can't emphasize this enough. So much in practice, you'll see people, it's very sad, they get a big p value. And then they're like, and we just looked at the post hoc to compare the groups still, but it doesn't make sense to compare the groups if there was no difference overall between any groups. Like it, it doesn't make sense anymore. But people like to do it because they, if you look at enough pairwise comparisons, you'll often find a p value that's small. It's just not really valid anymore if you didn't have a statistically significant result to start though. So it's always some questionable statistics that's often done, unfortunately. But in this case, we do have a statistically significant result. So we can do a valid uh, post hoc. Okay. Um, See, so yeah, I cannot emphasize that last sentence enough. So let's consider a post hoc so that we can see which cancer types lived the longest or shortest on average or which groups differed. Okay. So when you ask for post hoc output, SAS gives you a lot of stuff like always. Um, it gives you the average log survival, the standard deviations again. This is the number of people who had each cancer type. Okay. And then it gives you this output. So this is the post hoc specific output. It says least squares means. Adjustment for multiple comparisons, Tukey Kramer. So Tukey Kramer is the name of the people credited with this like method. Um, these LS mean numbers are giving like ID numbers to each group. So there's five groups and they're saying breast cancer is group one and so on down to stomach cancer is called group five. Okay. And the reason that's important is because they give these outputs where they, instead of listing out the group names, they just put the group numbers. So one, this is for breast cancer, and two right here is for bronchus cancer patients. So one and two, they give you this, this is called a, a matrix to show all the possible pairwise comparisons. So this is a table you can think of, of p-values from a bunch of two sample t-tests where this is the two sample t-test comparing breast cancer and bronchus cancer patients in terms of their average log survival. And then here you have breast cancer patients and stomach cancer patients, group five, the p-value for comparing their average log survival with a two sample t-test. So you can see that the 
this matrix is is what we'd call symmetric. So comparing groups two and one is the same as comparing groups one and two. You get the same p value in those two spots. Okay. So actually, all the unique results, you can look at the lower triangle here. And you can see that there's one, two, three, four, uh, 10. There's 10 unique comparisons here. Okay. And that has to do with that the number of ways to choose two groups from five is 10. So that's why there's 10 possible t tests you can do to compare the groups. Okay. okay. So, yeah, they give this output because ANOVA tells us at least two groups differed. But that doesn't mean that every group differed from each other. Um, so, in this case, we can see the p value is 0 0.008. So that's small. So breast cancer patients did differ from bronchus cancer patients group two. What about breast cancer patients compared to group three colon cancer? It's a high p value. So that suggests they did not differ in their average log survival. And then similarly with breast cancer versus ovarian cancer, that p-value is really high. They did not differ in their average log survival. So these are the p-values for all those tests. Um, we also get confidence intervals for the mean difference between each group. And you can interpret those as well, just like the confidence intervals for the two sample t-tests from before. Okay. So we will, yeah, we'll answer these parts next time. We'll look at this. Um, yeah, so that's where we'll pick up next time.